and it's also number 18. It's C in Psalm 40. So we've already done Psalm 40A, Psalm 40B, now it's Psalm 40C. <coughs> Uh, all together, it's class number 18. So apparently we're getting close to the end, because isn't there like 24 classes or something? Forget how many. Of them. Oh, yeah, good point. Of course, the first quarter was half of it was just one psalm. <coughs> all right, Psalm 40, and I'd like to uh, start at verse 5, because I'm just going to cover 5 through 8. Many, O Lord, my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are toward us, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Sacrifice and offerings thou didst not desire, mine ears hast thou opened. Burn offering and sin offering hast thou not required. <coughs> Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book that is written in me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. <clears throat> All right, so clearly this is a quote over in Hebrews chapter 10. <clears throat> and we must understand that the New Testament is the explanation of the Old Testament that the New Testament is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, that the New Testament explanation is the true meaning <clears throat> of what this means. And why is that the case? Because the true meaning is Christ. And the writers of the New Testament saw Jesus, and they broke the bread of life to us instead of just giving us a historical uh, rendition or a uh, prophetic rendition or a literal rendition they gave us the true meaning of the scriptures <clears throat> and clearly in he, uh, Hebrews 10 which we'll get into very quickly here clearly in Hebrews 10 the emphasis is totally on Christ but not surprising it is on Christ and him crucified and risen. Of course, normally when we say Christ and him crucified, we're talking about death, burial, and resurrection because that's all included in the concept <coughs> of Christ and him crucified. Um, the scriptures that are particularly quoted here uh, are dealing with sacrifice and offering and, and uh, the bringing in of the, of the new covenant <coughs> as the fulfillment of that. Therefore, verse 5 is um, being quoted by someone who has seen extensively the meaning of Christ here in these scriptures or the meaning of Christ in his fulfillment. <clears throat> and when I say that, I say because, because verse 5 is not a quote from an, an individual who is saying, oh, God is so good. He, he's done so many good things for me, I can't even count them all. It's not that at all. His rejoicing is over the incredible realities that the book of Hebrews is bringing out, and particularly chapter 10, and all of the wonders of what the cross and the resurrection and Jesus going through that did. And that's so, therefore, reading it in light, reading verse 5 in light of that. Um, this joy is not just a joy in God. I, I'm just joying in God. It is a joy and a deep apprehension of the cross and of Christ as the Lamb of God and the fulfillment of all of the sacrifices and everything. So let me read five again. Many, O Lord, my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done. Thy wonderful works, not just good work, wonderful works, but the, and, and thy thoughts which are toward us, <clears throat> not just your thoughts, not just God has good thoughts, God has deep thoughts. That's usually where we go with that. But your thoughts toward us. And Hebrews 10 is all about 
his thoughts toward us and what he has accomplished on our behalf. Because God didn't need that. In a certain sense, you know, I mean, Jesus didn't need that. And so, uh, if I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. And the writer of Hebrews saw this psalm, along with a lot of other scriptures, Genesis. and uh, uh, quote, The writer of Hebrews quoted a bunch of the psalms. <clears throat> well, that's what we're studying. And we're seeing that men of God that went before us, and, I, you know, I've, I've often sort of, you know, most people say that, that, that uh, Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. Now, there's no proof to that, and there's no definite, I mean, I think there's some differences of writing in there, and, and it's always been my secret hope that Thaddeus wrote the book of Hebrews, just because nobody, you know, nobody knows who he is. He's one of the 12, but, you know, you know, you know, Paul wrote that, and you get up in glory, and Thaddeus walks up and goes, Here, here's the writer of the Hebrews. We go, Dad, you know, you wrote that? <clears throat> so anyway, that's just a Randyism there. Sorry for the little divergence there. Okay, so let's go to Hebrews 10, because that's where these are all quoted, and that's where we're going to find the full recognition of their meaning. Now, for some who might be looking at this in terms of a study in Hebrews instead of Psalms, then Psalms 40 was a divergence, but that's the scripture where we get a good quote uh, from what Hebrews 10 is about. <clears throat> all right, as I said, one of the best things for me to do if I'm going to make any ground at all, and I do have quite a few pages, I, I, it would be good for me to read portions of this. So verse 1, um, well, let's see. First of all, it might be good to start at verse 5 and go through verse 9. Wherefore, this is Hebrews 10, starting verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering, and burnt offerings and offerings for sin thou wouldest not, neither hast pleasure in them, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. <clears throat> All right. So here we have clearly the, the quoting of those scriptures um, and f in uh, Psalm 40. <clears throat> and we start getting an inkling that these are uh, very important scriptures to fully comprehending or more clearly comprehending <clears throat> What is the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant? <clears throat> a lot of people, if you ask them that question, like right now, if I just ask, and, and each person could speak into a mic that nobody else would hear and we recorded it all, you'd be surprised at the answers that we would get. <clears throat> <clears throat> this is a very good chapter for helping make clear the differences between the Old and the New, the first and the second, as described here. All right, let's go to verse 1. Uh, let's read 1 through 4 since we started at 5 a second ago. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make those who come to it perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshipers once purged should have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices there is remembrance made again made of sins every year, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. All right. Now, while those scriptures in um, Psalms makes a reference 
to burn offerings, and this one quotes it, so it makes a reference to burn offerings. <clears throat> if you will notice, the primary emphasis of this writer is dealing with sacrifices for sin. He's really bringing it out. I mean, verse uh, ver into verse 3, no more consciousness of sin. Beginning of verse 4, or end of verse 4, again, made of sins every year. End of verse 3, sorry, I jumped there. Uh, bulls and, uh, blood of bulls and goats should not take away sins. Um, this primarily is dealing with sins. And if you'll notice the offerings that he described, he described bulls and goats. Does that ring a bell to anybody? Day of Atonement. Day of Atonement. Day of Atonement, a bull is offered for who? The high priest. And then two goats are offered for the people. One goat is killed, the other one, the sins are placed on it and put off. So, <clears throat> it's pretty clear that he's trying to deal with sins in a way that will be removed. So let's look at verse 1 again. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things. So let's just, you know, let's just consider. Let me just draw a, a, uh, an outline of my hand here. Let me do it like this. All right. So the outline that I just drew, it's a little fat hand, isn't it? Heavy little fingers. Actually, they're not. Um, the outline I just drew is represents the shadow, not the in image. My hand is the image. Okay. Okay. So we're we're dealing with method one and method two. We're dealing with old covenant and new covenant. The old covenant. I should have drawn this over there. <laughs> the old covenant is just a shadow. That hand cannot clench. It cannot pick up anything. It cannot touch you. It cannot touch you. A shadow cannot do anything except appear sort of like the image of the, the real. The exact image of what God had in mind. So from this we may understand that from the very beginning when God started this whole thing, when he brought Israel out of Egypt and they got to Mount Sinai and they wanted rules and stuff that they could obey, he gave them the shadow because they were wanting to do it themselves instead of it being Christ. So he said, okay, I'll give you the, I'll give you the shadow of it. But there's no strength in it. There's no ability in it. It does not fulfill what I want. It is a vague image of what I want, but it is not what I want. Can you see that? It's not at all. There's a real that I want. So let me read this. This, this shows a contrast between two methods for carrying out what God wants. And that's what method one and method two Method one being the old covenant, method two being the new covenant. Two methods for carrying out what God wants. Now, imagine if you didn't know the difference. You might actually be operating under the old method. And one reason why I'm using this terminology, method, because it really is one, way, one method or another. But when, if I had written up here old covenant and new covenant, our minds would immediately go to some religious thing with all the teaching that we've had behind that and try to work, work what I'm saying into that. So what I'm just doing is saying there was a method that, that really wasn't the right one. It was just a shadow. And there's a method that is exactly what he always wanted. And it's us being in union with Christ. It's, it's all being produced by life, not by works. Simple as that. All right, so the first one is just a shadow of the true one, the true method. It shadowed good things to come that we have, that, that now have come. It shadowed what has now come. All right, now some people say it was a shadow of good things to come. That, he said that back then, but the good things have come. 
Did you know that? The good things have come. Jesus died. He rose again. All of that's supposed to be real to us now. But we're still waiting for the... We're still living like we're in shadow land. All right? So I'm just... I don't want to go off on that a whole lot, but I just want to make sure that we understand that the good things have come. All right? Um, the good thing to come was Christ, of whom the shadow pointed and who was the fulfillment of the old. And that's what he means. When he says good things to come... He says, we're not going to deal with the shadow anymore. The good thing, the real thing, the one that who, of whom it was all about, is come. All right. We always think of things in terms of our, ourselves, so the good things are made to primarily pertain to us. Right? I mean, w I would normally think good things to come. Oh, you know, I'm like a, like a six-year-old kid. <gasps> Good things to come. Oh, boy. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. But I tell you, and while it does pertain to us, I will tell you this. Remember that God said, I, I am not pleased with sacrifice and offerings. It's, uh, it's not what I want. It's, you know, this is saying this is good stuff for him. I mean, yes, it does pertain to us. But my God, he's the one saying, you know. Uh, sacrifice and offering, I would not. Uh, I have no pleasure. That's verse 6 says, no pleasure in them. But now he's getting what he wants because it's not some weak, shadowy nothing that can't grab hold of anything and can't do anything, can't lift anything or anything. It's the very thing from which it got its shadowy reflection. And again, if you look at that hand and look at mine, my fingers look a lot longer in real life and they're not near as chubby. So it isn't even a good shadow. It's just sort of an outline-y type thing. All right, so <clears throat> um, the good things are finally the fulfillment that comes to God by getting what he wanted. And the sun is the answer to that. And I'm specifically saying that that the Holy Spirit may open that more to you later on. I could have said it was Christ or it was Jesus, but I want you to know that this book is tied strongly in to the Son. And if we don't see the difference, you know, we're, we may miss some important factors. All right, so he's the fulfillment, the Son is. Everything else no pleasure. Okay? The sun. Everything else, no pleasure. Okay. So, uh, in the old, we have bulls and goats, right? Let me write that up there. All right. In the old covenant or the old method, he has no pleasure in bulls and goats. All right, we can get that, can't we? That's pretty easy. One reason why it's easy, it wasn't as easy for them because God had ordained that, and then all of a sudden there's a change, and they were used to that, and there were offerings and stuff going on even then. Now that's changed. But for us, we can say... Method one does not work. The shadow of it doesn't work. He has no pleasure in it. You can say, us living sacrificially is the old method because it's us. It's not him. It's still not the real. It's a shadow of him. It's us shadowing him or copying him or trying to be that way. And Again, one reason why people get frustrated with this place is they don't understand what I'm saying. I have never said anything different from the beginning, folks. It's Christ. It is Jesus, the hope of you and me. I've always said it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's Christ in me, the hope. And all, any, any living sacrificially, and let me just go ahead and write that on the board too. And there's, there's different ways... Of, of doing this. But the point being 
It is still the old method. This is trying to offer something to God that is not Christ. So is this one. In other words, bulls and goats is trying to offer something to God that is not the Lamb of God. And us just living sacrifice, well, I'm going to give up stuff, or I'm going to go the extra mile on my own, and, or I'm going to do all that. And it's not Christ in us. It's not the Son in us. It's not the life of the one that he had in mind all along. He has no pleasure. How much? No pleasure. No pleasure. <laughs> he doesn't get anything out of it. There's absolutely no pleasure in it. And that's important to see because, because we think that the old method, the old covenant, see, that's why I didn't use it, the old covenant's passed away. Right? We think the old, but the old method hadn't passed away because people are still using it. People are still offering up their best. They're still doing for God. Does anybody have any clue where burnout comes from. Yeah, okay. Now I'm going to ask you this, and you, it, uh, I may not be correct, you may not be, but let me just ask you. In this m new method, new covenant, this new method, does burnout occur over here? Okay. Some said yes and some said no. Does burnout occur in method number one? Okay, why would burnout occur in method number one? Because it's us. It's flesh. And flesh, you know, the, you know, the new method says they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Yes. So just to clarify, it's like the flesh working harder than the spirit is working. Right. That's how it works out. Right. But, but let's go ahead and take it the, the full length, and that is it's flesh, not old man flesh per se. It's just humans who are trying to be Jesus or be like Jesus and we'll never measure up. We, we will, you know, what, I was just quoting uh, Isaiah 40, you know, what does it say? Um, uh, they shall run and not be weary, they shall walk and not, uh, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew, and the word renew their strength, do you know what that is in the Hebrew? Change strength. It means literal, no longer going by them, it's a new method. Okay? They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk. So in reality, if it's Christ, there is no burnout because it's not us. His strength is carrying us. His life is performing that. Now, when we, when we cross the line, see the line? <laughs> when we cross the line, then once we do that, then we're back into our own strength and there will all, we can only go so far. And, you know, just to make it clear, don't, you know, as much as if you, if it's them and not Christ, there's no need dumping extra weight on them. And I get accused of that all the time, but I promise you, I never would do that. That's not, that isn't even in my core as the Lord has made me now, as he's formed me up by Christ. I, I go out of my way to make it easy. <laughs> but for those that say it's Christ and I want Jesus, I'll, I'll put them in situations to find out if it is, but I never do it out of meanness or hardness or control or any such thing like that. I do it because until we are carried by these wings, it's us. And how are we going to know we're being carried by wings when you start mounting up and not growing weary and going, you know what, this is the Lord. Now that you know, let's, let's make it clear, though. It's not burnout, but you can still get tired by the life of Christ because he'll keep going. <laughs> he will keep going in you. And, you, it, you know, it may feel like burnout. You're just tired. I have had to tell the Lord, could we stop for a while? You know, it's like trying to keep up with Daddy, you know. Could, could we just take a little break here? And, of course, he's, he says that. I've had the Holy Spirit feeding me so fast I felt like I was being waterboarded, you know? Really. And I said, I can't, I can't take any more of this. It's just too much, you know? And you get a little bit of that in Psalm 40 where he says, you know, if I could number it, I, you know, but I can't. It's beyond, beyond us. <clears throat> All right. 
So I think it's, uh, it's important that we understand that this method, number one, isn't just old man flesh or, or corrupt flesh. It, it can just be us flesh, us, as opposed to him. Is that clear enough? I mean, I hope that is because there, that being just us doesn't necessarily mean that it's the old man or that we're wicked. We may be committed. We may be doing everything we know for God in a right spirit, as much as our spirit can be right, but it's still us. Looks like him, but it's not him. So as long as we got that, that's important because... Uh, because if this, is just a, if this is just a lesson, if Hebrews is just a lesson on what people did a long time ago and what we got now, then it's just more or less a history lesson or a theological lesson. But it needs to become something that we can work into our lives that becomes practical. I don't believe in just getting head knowledge. It needs to have a practical outlet. So the practical outlet is, when you say method number one is nothing more than me, me at my best, me at my most committed, or me at my worst, doesn't matter, just me. However I show up today, <laughs> it's, it's not by the life of Christ. And this 10th this chapter is going to get into that in an incredible, incredible way. But I need to move on here because we're not making much room. All right, the shadow offerings did not perfect us either. But we will see in this chapter that the true sacrifice by Christ does bring completion. Uh, completion through oneness. And that's what this chapter proves. Completion through oneness. Not just completion in yourself. We are complete in him. Doesn't it say that in Colossians? You are complete in him, in union, in, in union. Okay. So let's look at, uh, well, let me finish this. While both methods, methods use sacrifice as their means, only Jesus fulfills it. Method number one uses sacrifice and offering. Amen. Method number two uses sacrifice and offering. <laughs> Some of you may have caught a slight difference there. Did you? Method number, let me say it again. Method number one is fulfilled by or is done by sacrifices and offerings. Method number two is fulfilled by sacrifice and offering in relationship the chapter 10 information in relationship to the sin offering that he is particularly trying to deal with. One offering for all sin. Okay, It's important because uh, the sweet savor offerings actually continue night and day after this. But we're primarily dealing with the sin offering. All right, verse 2, For then would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers once purged should have had no more consciousness of sin. So if the sacrifices of the shadow had done the work and done it in a permanent way, then they would have ceased, meaning uh, they would cease from us as the source. They would cease uh, the let's just say it like this the Lord is saying the outward copies must cease <laughs> so for Israel they're over here putting bulls and goats on the altar and he would say the outward copies must cease give me the real for New Testament saints who are still living by the first method, he would say, the outward copying of Jesus inside of you must cease. Don't copy him. Let him be formed in you. Let him live through you. Okay? Because the thing that, you know, the thing that ceases is, number one, we cease 
from our works. But it doesn't mean stuff doesn't still happen in us. And I, that's a whole other story, so I won't go there. All right, verse 3. But in those sacrifices, there is remembrance made again of sins every year. Um, yeah, like the last word in verse 2 is sins. The third to the last word in verse 3 is sins. The last word in verse 4 is sins. This is all dealing with sins, all right? The fact that those sacrifices are still offered means it is not done and is a constant reminder of what? Our problems and failures. Does anybody find that following the Lord, there is a constant reminder of what a failure you are? Well, there can be that and then a recognition of that by method one and a moving to method two in every issue, every situation, because we do fail. The idea would be to get that so fixed in us that, you know, like they when they came to John the Baptist and said, "Oh my God, you're doing such great things. Are you the one?" He said, "I'm not the one. I'm not even worthy to loose his shoe latchet. I'm not it. I am. You know, I love that." Jesus said, "I am." John the Baptist said, "I am not." He is. And that has to be fixed. I mean, rock solid so that when you reach forth to touch the altar of incense, you reach forth to touch the altar, you reach forth, you stop your hand lest your leprosy be proven. Remember in the Old Testament when they would do that? Several different people, Uzziah and others, would touch it and then they would turn leprous. Well, why leprous? Because it's showing that you're not the one. You are messed up. Okay? And, and until, I guess maybe until you've done that and had that happen and you just go, oh, my God, oh, my God. And then you remember what happened when it wasn't him. It was someone else, I think, touched it. And he went leprous. And they all rushed, all the priests rushed in and grabbed him and threw him out of the temple. Remember that? I love that. Because <laughs> that's his house. And he's the one that fulfills this, not me and I'll never be I'll never let's put it there, I'll never be what I want to be only Christ will be that in me you give up your ambitions you give up your pride you give up all hopes of what you thought you were going to be and you let it be Christ well is that really so bad I mean you know I constantly get attacked for lifting up Jesus in this way and all I'm saying is he must increase and we must decrease. John said that. All I'm saying is, if I said it about politics, well, we need less of us and more of Jesus in politics, everybody go, yay! Well, as far as in f people's homes, we need less of us and more of Jesus, yay! But when you get specific, you say, you know, we need less of you and more of Jesus. I'll kill you for saying <laughs> All right, verse uh, 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. This is just a fact. It is not possible. So why do we keep trying through living sacrificially, or they keep trying by offering bulls and goats? Why, when it's not even possible? We, it, that's what I was trying to say. It's not possible. Okay. We hear that, we say, yes, Lord, but then we go walk right out of here and we set about to please God through us instead of by Christ. We say, okay, well, I'm going to be more. You just said you're going to be more. That's an increase. We, but didn't you say he must increase and we must decrease? Yes, but I'm going to be more fill in the blank, patient. I'm going to be more loving. I'm going to be more, you know, can't. We just let it be Christ? You know, you say, but someone says to me, well, if I let it be Christ, I won't do anything. No, that's still you. <laughs> that's still you. It has to be Christ. <clears throat> All right. Um, the shadow offerings will never do the job. Why? Because they're not the real. They are not Christ, whether outwardly or inwardly. 
Outwardly, it looks good to everybody. Jesus did this thing, we copy it. So we say, God's going to be pleased. But doesn't the Bible say, let's see, two were grinding, one was taken? Well, why did he get taken? I was grinding too. Two were walking up a hill, one was taken. Well, I was taking the hill too. What does that tell us? It tells us it's not about what you do. It's about the inward. Is the source Christ or is it us? <clears throat> All right. Verse 5. Now we're going to get into it. Now we're going to see. We're going to see an incredible reality behind what these scriptures are trying to tell us. He's going to usher us into a whole nother realm here in this verse. Verse 5 says, wherefore, uh, before you can understand wherefore, you've got to know why it's there. Wherefore comes from, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore? It's not possible. Therefore, something, wherefore, something's about to happen. It's not possible that method one will do it. Wherefore, we are about to be introduced to method two. Okay? Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Okay. Wherefore means because of the problems and failures of the method, the, the method one, the method that was used that gives a vague picture of the truth, the true came into the world with a different plan. Where He says, this could not, method one, this could not possibly do it. Wherefore, he cometh into the world and he says, method one, sacrifice and offering, bulls and goats and all this stuff, you do not please God. You do not fulfill it. You are not what he wants. He takes no pleasure in you, method one. Therefore, I am come. You following that? He is replacing the old method. And the good thing is, he almost repeats this in the following verses, but he says some things that make sure that if people were doubting when you first said it, that that's exactly what it's saying. And we'll, we'll get in that. We've got backup here. We got back up. Um, he addresses the old method by saying sacrifice and offering is not what God wanted, but a body you have prepared me. You see that? Okay, keep your place there because we're going to come back. But let's go back to Psalm 40 because we need to... We need to deal with a contradiction. And there are those of you who know the Bible contradicts itself, right? Psalm 40. Let's look at verse 6. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire, mine ears hast thou opened. Burn offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Does anybody see a difference between verse 6 in Psalm 40 and verse uh, 5 of Hebrews 10? I got one nod. Anybody else? If you, if you see the difference between the two, raise your hand. Okay? Okay. We're not going to move on until everybody can find a difference between verse 6 of Psalm 40 and verse 5 of Hebrews 10. There's one line that's different. Okay? Anybody else? Still getting hands here. Okay, good, good, good. All right, I won't embarrass anybody. Um, but the difference is, is that here in Psalm 40, verse 6, instead of saying, a body thou hast prepared me, it says, mine ears hast thou opened. All right. This is so fun to read commentators on this little deal right here. It is so fun 
because they cannot figure it out. They get into this and they're going, well, this is a contradiction. And, you know, there are contradictions in the Bible. And there are times when, when they give wrong numbers or wrong phrase. And the, the original Hebrew, now this is somebody speaking who knows the original Hebrew and therefore knows the mind of God, not, <laughs> says... The original Hebrew says, mine ear that hast thou opened. We don't know why this guy in Hebrews 10 said, a body thou hast prepared me. And they are bum puzzled and every one of them just get all freaked out. But the answer is found in what spiritually happened, and we'll get into this shortly, what spiritually happened. In other words, the mind of God is the translation, not the Hebrew. Or the, the you know, why, why did he, I mean, it's one thing to maybe slightly miss it, but there's a big difference between mine ear you open and a body you have prepared me, okay? The answer to this is found in the mind of God. Just like in reality, we think we know so much else because it, we can understand it with our mind. You'll never understand anything until you see it from the mind of the Lord. And so, um, he is about to, and we're going we're gonna to hold off just a little bit before we get into that fully. But let me just say this. This ear being opened and this body being prepared is the same thing. It is in the same act and it is in the same cross and it is in the same piercing that it all takes place. And if you don't know what's happening, you won't get it. And you'll read a commentator and you'll say, though, they're scholars, they know more than I do. They don't know more than the Holy Spirit. And that's the only place you're going to get it or I'll get it or anybody will get it. <clears throat> All right. Before we get into that, first consider sacrifice and offering is not what God wants. Okay. Now, all right. There are several different ways to look at that. But remember, we're dealing with sins. And sacrifice and offering is not what God wants in relationship to sins. Why? All right. You remember the scripture in uh, 1 Samuel uh, 1522 says this to obey is better than sacrifice all right what does that mean well maybe I should just read what I've got instead of saying it. a sacrifice for sin is needed after the fact after sin has already been committed that's when you need a sacrifice for sin after sin has happened okay but if a person obeyed they would not need sacrifice. Does that make sense? Sacrifices, for sins anyway, is only there for one reason, because you messed up. In other words, sacrifice and offering does not remedy the problem. It only remedies the failure. What is the failure? Sinning. What is the remedy? Sacrifice and offering. But it didn't stop you from sinning. It only fixed, it covered your mistake. So he's saying covering your mistake is not what pleases God, right? Sacrifice and offering, thou wouldest not. That's not what you want. Just covering what we do wrong. To obey is better than sacrifice. <clears throat> All right, so... Uh, if a person obeyed, they would not need sacrifice. The word but is used to introduce the alternative to the old method, and that uh, old method, that is what God did want. So we're talking about, and we're back in Hebrews again, Hebrews 10, verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but, in other words, I don't want a remedy for failure. And that's all that sacrifice and offering is. It doesn't take failure away. It just covers it. All right. So he says, but I've got a new method. 
a body thou hast prepared me. Um, so you could, uh, now, the body, the body we're talking about is the body of Christ. The method that he brought in that was new isn't sacrifice, but it's the body of Christ that we're made one with. Jesus was always holy. Jesus was always good. He was always this. What makes us able to obey and not need sacrifice for sins is we're the body or the vehicle of Christ. He's the life. He's the nature. He's the one that overcomes sin. He's the one that doesn't stumble. He's the one who will fulfill all God's will. Okay? So when he's talking about the body here, he's not talking about the incarnate body of Christ. He's talking about the resurrected body of Christ because what took away sacrifice and sin and what brought in the new covenant, folks, wasn't the incarnation of Christ. It was the death and resurrection of Christ. Can I get amen on that? That's what, that was what brought in the new covenant. Okay. So the body of his resurrection is different than the body of his incarnation. The body of his incarnation is simply his body. The body of his resurrection is us. You want to see the resurrection body? You know, they're looking in a tomb. They need to look at themselves. We are the resurrection body of Christ. We are the body of Christ since the resurrection. Can I say it any different? That'll help you to get that. We're, we're the body of Christ since resurrection. We're the resurrection body. They're looking in the tomb going, where, where is he, you know? And... You know, he's having to do certain things on the road to Emmaus and to Mary Magdalene just for them to figure it out because they couldn't look at his body and see his body anymore because we are his body. Okay? All right. So let's see. Um, in Psalm 40, verse 6, it says, My ear you have opened. It comes from Exodus 21, so keep your place here in Hebrews, and let's go to Exodus 21. And I know most of you are familiar with Exodus 21, but I think the Lord has shown me some new things here based on Hebrews 10 that might open your ears. <laughs> 21, uh, Exodus 21, and uh, blah, blah, starting verse 2. All right, let's start at verse 1. Now, these are the ordinances which thou shalt set before them. Verse 2. If thou buy a Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and in the seven he shall go out free for nothing. If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he was married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master have given him a wife, and she have borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Then, the ma then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or unto the uh, or unto the door post, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. All right. Uh, it pictures a servant who was bought. Okay, so it's basically a slave for seven years. Okay, on the sabbatical year, or after seven years, he is freed. But first, let's just see that it pictures a servant who has been bought and he is now a slave to his master. If the servant was brought in, and you have to, here's, here's where you're going to catch some of this. This little phrase, brought in, because that's what it's using. If he was brought in by himself and made a slave, that's one thing. 
If he got a wife or was brought in with a wife and children, that's another thing. If he got a wife and children while he was there for those seven years as a slave, that's another thing. And if his master gave him wife and children, that's another thing. So you have to follow the, the pattern of what it's talking about here. Uh, it, if the servant was brought in by himself as a slave, then in the sabbatical year, he goes out on his own. It's the Sabbath year. You're free. You've served me as a slave. Go. All right. However, if the master, if the master gave him a wife and she had children during the time of his servitude, he can go out by himself but without them. Remember, there is a connection between the ear being opened and the servant gaining a body. That right there is so key because there are two things happening at the same moment. He's taken to the thing and his ear is being uh, pierced. His ear is being opened. His ear is being pierced. And that piercing says... You are a servant to me in a completely different way. A com you could say a completely different method than you were before. One method, well, one method required it. The other method has free will involved in it. All right. So remember, there is a connection between the ear being opened and the servant gaining a body. He was taken to a doorpost and his ear was pierced as a mark of now serving by love from the heart and no longer because of required obedience by the law. All right. And uh, keep in your place there, but let me read uh, Psalm 40 again, some of the verses that we read originally with this. Uh, then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me, I delight to do thy will. O oh God, yea, thy law is written within my heart. That's a whole different ballgame there. I delight to do this. Folks, over here, you are a slave to the law. You are a slave to what it tells you. You must obey it. This is a, the law is a schoolmaster that demands or you'll be punished or whatever. Okay? But Jesus said, I'll come. And when I come, I... It, in the, in the book of Hebrews, it says, I come to do thy will, O God. But in, in um, Psalm 40, he says, I delight to do thy will because thy law is written on my heart. Do you see that? That that is, he's not a bond slave in the sense of what we are by the law. He loves, he delights doing that. Okay? Do you? No. You delight doing some things, but other things really bugs you that he would even ask that of you. Okay? All right. So, um, this new servant, because it's like a transition has come. It's like he was under, I'm so sorry, you're under method number one. It's like he was under that for seven years and had to do it. Born of a woman, born under the law. When Jesus came, that's how he walked. Like he had to do it. But he said, sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not. Offerings for sin and failure and rebellion and disobedience. Am I right or wrong? Am I naming the sins that are there? He says, you don't want that to obey his sacrifice. Therefore, I will come body thou hast prepared me. Now I know we haven't got fully into to see exactly how this body is prepared for him. But that's what we're going to see. Let me see if I can at least wrap up wrap up part of this. How much time do you have on your little thing? Five minutes. That's, that's good. Alright. So this new servant has come in order to gain a body or a bride. According to Ephesians 5.25, he said, I gave myself, I laid down my life that I may 
have a bride. I died for her. Okay? So this new servant is not just not just confessing his love for his master and is coming into a new relationship with his master by having his ear pierced. He's gaining a bride. He is gaining a bride that he didn't have before. Let me make sure I read this so you get this. She was given, she was, she was given to the servant, to the male servant in servitude, but did not belong to him. Remember what, the, what Exodus 21 says? That if, if you're in servitude and she's given to you by your master when the seven years is up, you have to go out alone. Right? What does that mean? What does it mean? What? She's not really yours. Absolutely right on. She was not his, though they were joined and had children. She still belonged to the master, the law, the schoolmaster. And he had to go out alone, unless he be pierced. Unless he be pierced. All right, so in, while he was in serv servitude, uh, she may have been his wife, but she did not, I've got it in all capitals, did not belong to him. She and the children belong to the master who demands slaves to be obedient. Okay? It was only at the piercing that she became his. When he said, I love my master, I love my wife, I love my children, he took him to the doorpost, he pierced his ear, and that said, that made a statement for him first that would, have, would eventually affect her and the children. But it has to first be in him. Then it will affect the body. Are you starting to get this? A body that thou hast prepared me? One in, in uh, Psalm 40, it says, Mine ear thou hast pierced. In Hebrews, it says, A body thou hast prepared me. Folks, the piercing of the ear and the gaining of the body was the same act. When he did that, she became his for the first time. Okay. Um, it was only at the piercing that she became his. They were now, now, at the piercing, at the cross. They were now made one. Do you see that? The oneness was never there except at the cross. That's where it took place. It was through this oneness that she and the children would gain his heart of serving uh, by love because it was in him to do so. Okay. He's the... He's the head, she's the body, and there's the children. What's true of the head flows down. Amen? He said, I love my master, and I will serve out of love. No more will I serve by the law. You getting it? No more will I serve by the law. When he did that, he got his ear, he was pierced, he died for that truth to be true, but he also gained a bride right there at the same moment that it happened, and oneness started right there, so that what was in his heart would flow down through the body, the only hope of the body, the only hope of the wife, is his heart. Amen? Yes. A little louder. Leviticus 8, when they pierce the uh, priest's ears in the consecration, first Aaron, who's the head, gets his right ear pierced. In the next chapter, all the priests, because he's the high priest, and the other priests right after him, they all get their ear pierced. It's like it flows right down to them being consecrated under the Lord in that same way. Given as a body, they're given, you know, to the Lord. All right, so he. So this servant has done all that he does now out of love. You get it? I know she's cute, but she's not cuter than Jesus in all of this. 
He did all he did out of love. He now served on a different basis. Man, you got to see this. That's, that's why Hebrews 10 is saying this. He left this method of law and of, of even the necessity of bulls and goats because now he's going to serve by this method. He's going to serve by love and life and what's true in him because he serves by that is going to be true of his body, the one that he took in the piercing. Okay, His ear was now open to a different approach. I mean, in reality, his ear was open to a different approach. He left the old method, and he came into the method that serves by love and by life. Okay? And when he did that, the only thing that brought him into that was the piercing. And when the piercing took place, he changed methods. He also gained a body. He gained a bride. At that same instant, all that was taking place. Um, I wrote, his ear is now open to a different approach, but to the same demands. What we couldn't do under the law demanding it of our flesh, the Bible says the law is holy, just, and good. It doesn't say there's a problem with the law. It says we are carnal, sold under sin. Did you know that? There's nothing wrong with the law. There's something wrong with us. That's what it says in Romans. That, you know, he said, now I'm discovering. I thought it was the law. I thought the problem was the law. But the law is holy, just, and good. We are carnal, sold under sin, under the master who, who gets what he wants by demanding it. Okay? Those demands are still there. Jesus, even in Matthew 5, says, not one jot or tittle of this law will pass away till all be kept fulfilled. fulfilled not kept because Christ is the fulfilling of the law still is he's the one that loves with all his heart soul and strength and that passes down to his body he's the one that fulfills every ounce of it he's the one that doesn't kill and so the new method all for him happened at the cross he changed methods he rose from the dead and would no longer be under the law, born of a woman under the law. He also, at the same exact moment that he was pierced, gained him a bride, gained him a body. His ear now opened to a different approach, but the same demands. Jesus did not come to do away with the law. All right. Um, let me just read uh, back in Hebrews, and then we'll stop, because we've got, are we totally out? It, it's gone. Okay. Well, then we'll do that next. It's going to be Hebrews uh, verses 6 and 7.